Well, good evening and welcome uh, back to a Wednesday night Bible study and worship. We are continuing our study with the Beatitudes. And uh, I didn't know that I would be doing all of the lessons on the Beatitudes, but uh, it's my pleasure to continue uh, studying and presenting the notes of Nate Fritz. Uh, I will continue to give him... Uh, all of the credit. If anything that you take is edifying, it is all him. If anything is confusing, it's probably something that I added. Uh, so we will continue with the Beatitudes. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Is this microphone on? Can you hear me? It's cl- Oh, it's better there. Move it up. Do you want me to be louder? Ooh, will it do this? While y'all are turning to Matthew chapter 5, is that better? I don't have to shout as much. Excellent. I broke the mic on Sunday, so they gave me a new one. Let's read together in uh, Matthew chapter 5. I really don't like it. I wish it was louder. We'll do that. I'll talk loud. So Matthew chapter 5, let's read in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It could rightly be said that from verse 3 through verse 12, you have a summation of what it means to be in the kingdom of God. What it means to be saved. What it means to be a true believer what it means to know God. It's all wrapped up in these incredibly short statements. Blessed are us. These blessings come to us from God when we are able to obtain these small phrases. When we are understanding of our poverty, we, whatever it says there, ours is the kingdom of heaven. When we mourn, we shall be comforted, etc. We continue the study... Looking at verses 9, 10, and 11. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The idea of peace actually permeates the Bible. In fact, there are almost 400 references to peace in the scriptures. The Bible opens and closes with peace. When God originally created man and woman, he put them in a garden. It was a garden of peace. Then came the fall of man, and peace with God was interrupted. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28. The book of Ezekiel tells us about the end of peace. It reads, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom. Oh, I didn't tell you the verse. Verse 12, we'll beginning read uh, 12 through 16. You had the seal of perfection, it says, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you, On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until righteousness, unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. 
The great and beautiful creation of God was corrupted by the decisions of mankind, and indeed we still do today. Only a few generations into mankind's existence on the earth, God was then resolved to destroy mankind and indeed everything on the earth with water, as you remember, due to the conflict between the Creator and the creation. King David in Psalms 14, turn your Bibles with me there, Psalms chapter 14, illustrates the position mankind brings to the relationship of God. Psalms 14 It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Verse 2, the Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. Verse 6. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his captive people, Jacob will rejoice, Israel will be glad. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. We'll read verses 9 and 10. And we'll look at how God thinks about mankind's attempt at peace without Him. This is quoted from what we just read in Psalms 14, but also Psalms 53. This is Romans chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It says that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Romans 3, verse 23. For all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Indeed, I read that wrong. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's much different to say it in the present, isn't it? We can understand our position without God and His grace with these verses. We're not worthy of the blessings that we receive We're not worthy of being redeemed. We are worthy only to revel in our squalor and succumb to the wrath that our Creator has brought on this world before. Utter destruction. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we'll read verses 8 to 14. Another account which reflects Paul's very witnessing of Christ on the road to Damascus in reflection. I love this verse because it gives shivers down my spine. Hopefully it will do you as well. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. There were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, Peace among men with whom he is pleased. Therefore, the story of redemption is the story of peacemaking between God and mankind. And the only sense in which there is no peace is when man refuses the peace that God offers. That is Jesus Christ. God wants peace for us. And those who follow him want peace And Jesus came and brought peace to us. 
and intends for us not only to be benefactors of that peace, but promoters of it. So learning about peace, what that peace means, and how to be peacemakers is actually critical for us following after Jesus. Because people turn away from God and turn to themselves, we live in a world of chaos even now. It's a world of conflict. It's a world of trouble. It's a world of shattered dreams and hopes and broken relationships. This is the reason for Jesus' teaching in the Beatitudes. What God says, brothers and sisters, is that peacemakers are desperately needed. Notice God offers the world peacemakers. Right here in verse 9 of Matthew 5, if you have your Bible still there. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, which necessarily infers that there are those who are peacemakers. And they are the ones that shall be called the sons of God. What that means is that if you and I are Christians, we are to be peacemakers. Now, as we think about what that beatitude means, let's consider some questions together. What is the meaning of peace? When we talk about peace, what exactly are we talking about? I suppose for many people, peace could be defined as the absence of war or conflict. But that really isn't God's definition of peace. God's definition of peace is not just about the absence of something bad. Most people would say, well, peace means there's no strife, no conflict, no animosity. In Scripture, peace is not about the absence of these things, as much as the presence of blessings from God. Peace comes from being blessed by God. Peacemaking cannot exist unless there is conflict, strife, or war. Think about it. You can't make peace from other peace. You have to have something to counteract it. We're not talking about the Miss America concept of world peace either, which really is an evasion of an issue. For example, it's the kind of peace we might be able to relate in our own homes, the times where we have conflict with our loved ones. But we just keep quiet about it because we know that if we open up lines of communication, war will suddenly erupt. That's an evasion of the issue, something of a problem that's smoldering inside our relationship. It may be a kind of peace to think of that, but it's really just evading the issue. It's more of a compromise, a concession. That's not the biblical peace. Even churches experience this in a twisted sort of peace when there is known sin in the family which should be confronted and dealt with. But nobody has the courage to confront it because it will blow sky high the roof of the church. So they simply compromise what the Bible clearly teaches about discipline and love. I know some of us even here in this room have witnessed the brethren of Christ divide over the silliest reasons. Evasion of an issue is not what creates real peace. In fact, in Jeremiah's day, God says two times in the book of Jeremiah, turn in Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 10 through 12, I'll read another entry while you are turning. Jeremiah says, From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain, prophets and priests alike. All practice deceit. That's Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13. In Jeremiah 8, verses 10 through 12, it reads, They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially, saying, Peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They certainly were not ashamed, and they did not know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment they shall be brought down, says the Lord. Jeremiah 8, verses 10-12. through 12. God never tells us to create an environment of so-called peace by a lack of communication or by lying, simply ignoring the problem. He never allows us to be comfortable evading issues of the spirit of righteousness. We're simply saying that there is peace when there isn't any, trying to delude ourselves, just to keep the environment tranquil. Rather, God expects his people to stand for what is right, and both by word and action to stand against what is wrong. He never allows a faithful Christian to avoid confronting sin for the sake of superficial truths. On the other hand, biblical peace conquers error, confronts sin, and produces 
a true peace through that conflict. Biblical peace is a peace that exists after the struggle has been resolved with sin. For example, that inner war between sin and righteousness, Paul describes in Romans chapter 7, turn with me there, Romans 7, it shows conflict and turmoil. We begin reading in verse 21 of Romans 7, evil is present with me, it says, the one who wills to do good. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a picture of how peace is derived after sin has been confronted even in our own self. We've continued to study about the Beatitudes and how it is a how-to book, a lesson on how we become a better Christian. And even now, peacemaking has to be done within our own members with sin. James wrote about what is a true kind of peace in James chapter 3. Verse 17 says, The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. That's James chapter 3 verse 17. Notice what it says here. It says, peace comes from purity first. You remember in Matthew chapter 5, what beatitude became before this one? Blessed are the pure in heart. Last time we talked about how to make your heart, heart pure. Excuse me. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. Peace is never sought at the price of truth. Peace is never sought at the price of sin. Or unrighteousness. Turn a few pages back in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 puts it this way Follow peace with all men and holiness. It's not a true peace because you don't confront sin, it's not a true peace because you don't confront error. You just let it exist in a superficial kind of truce. The Hebrew writer teaches us to follow the peace that is associated with holiness. Follow the peace that is first pure and reflects the wisdom from above. We certainly may abandon opinion or preferences or even speculation, but we do not abandon clear truth. We do not abandon proper purity. We do not abandon holiness. We do not cry peace when there is no peace. In fact, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all who live godly lives will suffer persecution even. I mean, just living your godly life is disruptive to the world, isn't it? Think about it. Living your godly life in your home or your school or your work or your neighborhood, in the relationships that you encounter daily, everyone around you, it disrupts those, doesn't it? It's so much easier to just not deal with it. And this isn't being a peacemaker. But when real peace comes, it comes not because we avoid those issues, Because issues are resolved, conflict is resolved, the resolution is then real peace in God. True peace is the peace that occurs when truth, purity, and holiness prevails. In 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul teaches if we are to create peace and promote it, it's because we all think the same way over biblical matters. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The peace that God is after is the peace that comes to those who agree about the truth of God. The Christian who enters conflict for the truth, the Christian who willingly combats error, who confronts lies, falsehood, gossip, and error, the Christian who will point out heresy, the Christian who will lovingly and gently point out sin to a brother or sister, in the end is not a divider. He's not a disruptor. He is a peacemaker for God working toward true peace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's an idea of godly peace. He's not talking about opinions or even speculations but rather being perfectly united in mind and thought 
regarding what God has said. Isn't that a beautiful thought? We find that, hopefully, in the, among the brethren. True peace is the child of truth. True peace can only come when truth reigns and everyone agrees to that truth. True peace brings everyone closer to God. Jesus was the greatest peacemaker that has ever lived on this earth because he came into the world offering peace. What kind of peace? Peace with God. And was he a disturbing person in society? So disturbing, in fact, that nearly the whole of the population of Israel turned against him and executed him. The world will look at us the same way. They look at him and they see that he was anything but a peacemaker. He was a troublemaker, like the prophets of old, indeed. And he was the one who created problems and strife. But as we look through the righteous mind, we see the exact opposite. So, biblical peacemakers, those spoke of in Matthew chapter 5, are not quiet, easygoing people who don't want to make issues happen with their friends or loved ones, who lack any understanding of doctrine, who lack justice or righteousness, who are nice and compromising, who are appeasers of men. No, a true peacemaker will not tolerate the status quo if the status quo dishonors God. He seeks a peace that demands truth. He seeks to bring to light what is right and find peace with God and others through truth. That's the meaning of the biblical peace here in the Beatitudes. What is, this, what is the menace to this peace? What threatens this peace between God and man? Indeed, sin. Whether it is sin in terms of rejection of that truth or sin in terms of conduct and how we behave. Peace is that peace that is goodness and righteousness. The enemy of that peace is unrighteousness and sin. So in order for there to be real peace, sin has to be dealt with. Sin in terms of how we think, or what we believe, and sin in terms of how we behave. Listen to James chapter 3, verse 18. And the seed, he says, whose fruit is righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's James chapter 3, verse 18. That the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Peacemakers sow the seeds of righteousness. They confront sin because the only true peace is the peace that is gained when sin has been confronted. I'm realizing that I've said peace about 400 times, haven't I? It's okay. In my head it sounds really good before I brought up here. That would be true in your own life, isn't it? Go back to the first beatitude in Matthew 5. Here you have the flow of someone coming to God. First, they're coming as a poor in spirit. That means they're spiritually bankrupt. They're overwhelmed with their own sin. They realize their iniquity. They realize they are impoverished when it comes to offering God anything good. They have nothing by which to gain heaven or even earn their own forgiveness. They come spiritually stripped and barren and bankrupt and destitute. And secondly, they are mourning over that condition. This mourning causes a change within them. Verse 5 of Matthew 5. But they have a couple things going for them. They are meek and humbled in heart because of the change that happens within them. And they're hungering and thirsting for what is righteous before God. Verse 6. And thanks be to God, He gives us mercy once we learn to be merciful to others. And they are purged and cleansed and become pure in heart by the trials of this life, and by making the right and true choice. And having become pure in heart, they then become the peacemakers, bringing and winning souls for God. True peace comes through the gospel, and we become the peacemakers of the world. When Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, he was declaring the responsibility of every Christian to take every opportunity to be a peacemaker to the glory of God. We will never have lasting peace without truth and righteousness. As long as a person is unrighteous, rejecting God's truth, as long as a person is unforgiven, as long as a person is in sin, there will never be any peace for him. Though truth can bring conflict and turmoil indeed, to those willing to humble themselves, 
ultimately Jesus will bring them peace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, God is called the God of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, we are told, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. God is the author, creator, and the source of peace. Paul concludes the Roman letter in, in chapter 15, verse 33. It says, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. He called him in 2 Thessalonians the Lord of peace. Hebrews ends with the God of peace being referred to. Ephesians 2, 14 describes Jesus as our peace. Ephesians 6, 15 calls the gospel the gospel of peace. Colossians 1.20 reminds us that God made peace through the blood of Jesus on the cross. We can't have peace in our own heart, in our homes, in a church, in a nation, or between nations, until we come to know the God of peace through the peacemaker Jesus Christ and His gospel of peace. This is an incredible statement is that there's only one group of peacemakers on the face of the earth. It's not NATO. It's not any type of secular institution. It's those who follow and seek after the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's those who then, after this, hold fast and teach the gospel of peace to the lost still today. We are the peacemakers because we help others make peace with God. We must have courage to be a peacemaker in your stance for the truth, and the spreading of the gospel to those who need God, but also in the issues of life that come and go, the little irritations of life, when someone cuts you off in traffic, or takes your home or your family away from you, relational conflicts, opinions and preferences that can create conflicts and disunity among brethren. Choose to be a peacemaker. We swallow our pride, We take the high ground. I need to admit whenever I've done wrong, and so do you, when I hurt someone unintentionally or intentionally, and forgive the wrongs others have done to me. Forgive injuries. And let love cover a multitude of sins, as it says in 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Are you a peacemaker? We become peacemakers when we make peace with God ourselves when we believe and obey the gospel of peace, the war with God ends. So, let's calibrate our thinking to 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's turn with me there. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. When we become truly converted, and we live out the gospel as peacemakers, we receive what Jesus talks about in the next beatitude, and that is persecution. The result is persecution. To not sound that this progression is backward and unfair, we must consider our situation before coming to Christ, before coming to Christ, and being reconciled to God. You're going to face consequences for living in Christ, for unity with God. It doesn't seem fair, does it? That we will be treated poorly and harshly by those on this earth when we're trying to do everything in our power what is right in the eyes of God. It is also equally unfair that we are are spared from what we deserve and treated with unspeakable kindness and mercy from our Creator. Either way that we choose to obey God or not, we're given what we do not deserve, so we may as well choose righteousness. 
When we are truly converted and begin to live out the gospel, as what's described in the Beatitudes, we do receive all the previous blessings talked about. But it's also true we will be persecuted for a while in this world. These aren't very nice and fun things to talk about, are they? First of all, Jesus says, Blessed are the persecuted. It's important to notice that he also says, For the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11 of Matthew chapter 5 simply personalizes it. Blessed are you when man casts insults at you. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, turn with me there, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 says, It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. Scripture tells us that persecution simply goes with the territory. If we live bold lives as peacemakers, we will stand out from the world. Our open speech, our activities, our conversation, our spreading of the gospel, our overall demeanor will give us away. And we will produce a similar reaction to the world as Jesus did. Look for a moment at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That's a great statement, which talks about our salvation. How great is God's mercy. We're born again to a living hope, it says, an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, that will not fade away, reserved for us. Look at verse 5 of 1 Peter 1. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter says we're protected by God for salvation, which He has reserved for us. Look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. That's not putting light what we have to suffer and endure, but it gives us hope. It only happens for a little while. And then the reward is eternal. But why? Look at verse 7. In order that your faith may be proven being more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The trials that come, including persecution and trouble and difficulty, are part of God's proving ground, wherein He is displaying our faith for all those to see, those outside the church and inside to the rest of our brethren for strength. If you are, and I are nothing but weedy ground in which the seed of truth is only allowed to grow a bit before we let the weeds choke it out, then it will become evident. Or if we are that stony ground where the root only goes so far before it encounters a hardened heart, then it will show. One can only live so long after they've hardened their heart to God's correction and instruction. Our faith under trials, even fiery ones, reveals our praise glory and honor toward God. Our faith either shows up or refuses to show up under confrontation, persecution, and other trials. There are those in Peter's time, and especially in those still today, those willing to be identified with Christ as long as it doesn't cost them very much. Peter is saying the same thing Jesus has says. He's simply expounding on it through inspiration. 
Our faith will be tested, that he says. The question is, what will it show in you? And what will it show in me? Will it be the fruit of spirit? Or will it be to our own destruction? Following Christ could affect your work, your career, your family life. It certainly will affect your social life and the activities that you participate in. It affects the words that originate in your heart and come out of your mouth. Just as it affects what we text, we put on social media, or we scream at whatever political opponent we didn't vote for. It affects how some were accepted in their families. How we teach our families. How we talk to our loved ones. It even affects where you go. Many were ostracized ostracized from entire communities that they'd grown up in, had friends and family, and they had all lost for the glory of God. Such things were easy to endure compared to the penalties of some of the brethren of Christ have suffered. It's noteworthy that there's an attitude being conveyed here. In the original language, blessed are those who have willingly endured continued persecution, who willingly suffer continual hostility against us. Turn in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Persecution isn't always going to be extreme or intense. I pray that you and indeed I and all of our brothers and sisters around the world never suffer the forms of persecution that those who have suffered throughout history. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 32 to 38 says, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, verse 33, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy. Wanderings in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Would we suffer our own comforts here in America, our families, our lives, for God if we had to? One thing that we can never doubt is that these brothers and sisters in the faith proved to all the world who God is and the strength true Christian faith can have. And whether great persecution or less extreme, Jesus says through Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, If we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified with him. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. We've run out of time. My rambling's on. I had four pages left. But we'll read this one chunk, 1 Peter chapter 4. We continue on from where we left off. In 1 Peter 4, it says, They think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. They speak evil of you. This is our persecution. But look in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. We'll read 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you from your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Verse 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ... Keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. Verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian... He is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in His name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, 
what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. We're not talking about persecution for any and every reason. We're talking about persecution for the sake of God. And in that we'll be rewarded with eternal glory with him. Thank you for your attention and for my continued ramblings. I think uh, I'll be conversing with Nate about what subjects we'll teach on Sunday. I know that it will be continuation of the teachings of Jesus and the lessons that we can learn in our own lives. Thank you very much.